Testing, testing. Testing, am I ready to go? Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. I guess it's still good morning. Thank you so much for being here this morning and for your interest in the Arab Spring, its impact and implications. It is quite an honor to have you and I am honored to be again part of the World Economic Forum for the first time in Vienna, but uh, quite a regular from Davos to the regional uh, meetings in the Middle East, Turkey and beyond, and New York where I reside. Um, so. The Arab Spring, uh, the way we're going to handle this conversation, basically we want to see how will the popular uprisings in the Middle East and in North Africa, how will they reshape political agendas and business strategies both within and beyond the region. I am honored to have a wonderful uh, panel here and I'll start by introducing them one by one. We have the President of Latvia, Valdis Zatlers. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. President. We have next to him uh, uh, Khalid Abdullah Janahi. He is the honorary chairman, Vision 3 from the UAE. And uh, next to him we have Mr. Mustafa Kamil Nabli, the governor of the Central Bank of Tunisia. Then we have Ahmed uh, Oren, and he's the chief executive officer, Elas Holding Turkey. And last but not least, we have Tariq Youssef, he is the Dean of Dubai School of Government from the UAE as well. Welcome, gentlemen. Mr. President, how hard are transitions? How easy? What are the greatest uh, expectations in terms of the length of such transitions and the biggest disappointments? Give us a parallel, if you will. You have an experience there. I'm a representative of singing revolution. We will usually call these uh, processes in a nice emotional words like Arab Spring. We had a, spring, uh, we had a singing revolution more than 20 years ago. And I was a part of that. And we were the first in transition. That's advantage of an Arab Spring. You have definite examples, patterns, experiences, uh, uh, pitfalls, all what we got in this, in this process. But what is uh, similar? The similar is uh, the will of the, of the people for change. The will to, towards democracy, towards uh, the freedom of speech, you know political freedoms, religious freedoms, uh, and of course, free movement uh, of, of, of people around the globe. So these inspirations and these, this will uh, has been expressed in a very visible way. We saw the people in, uh, in Cairo and uh, all the globe understood these people want change and they need assistance. Uh, of course, uh, we had the same things. We had the Baltic chain of people now connecting you now three Baltic capitals, and we had a lot of demonstrations in a, in a peaceful way. We started a transition. Is it easy or not? Uh, it isn't easy. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the uh, main goals? We have to set up uh, definite goals, and that's relevant also for the Arab world. At first, of course, we all know the theory, the institution building, the building of civil society. Uh, that's 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 uh, that's the basis, but we have to create a definite goals, and after these uh, first you know were started, we had definite goals: joining EU, moving towards European values, moving towards the European system uh, of of life, and uh, this is very important at that stage. Uh, is it over? It will not be over, I will tell maybe later on other questions, that mm -hmm. it's still going on. And what are the ills mm -hmm. that continue through the transition? Uh, corruption? Is corruption one of them? Uh, you see, it, I will say yes. Uh, uh, because when you have a transition, the start of the transition, in every society you have uh, some people who are more active uh, in the previous structure of power and they uh, really are the first to participate in transition and to, to really keep the power that's a very easy uh, motivation they want to keep the power and it is still there 20 years later that's very interesting i think we're witnessing something similar in the arab spring we'll get back to that um, Mustafa Nabli, i want to read to you something uh, that i will quote out of uh, an article, uh, an op-ed that uh, was written 
by the GAC uh, on Europe, which is the Global Action Committee. As you know, the World Economic Forum has established this very important series of GACs to deal with regional issues. And one of them is uh, uh, this one. And it, the title is Europe Must Rise to the Challenges Presented by the Arab Spring. And I want to read you the first sentence. Europe's response to the Arab Spring has been lacking in ambition, imagination, and generosity. Do you agree? The, the political answer or the... Uh, I, I want the real answer on answer. your mind. I know you speak your mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe in, or, in order to uh, respond to that question, let me try to explain what, what is it that we see now for us in Tunisia, the, big, the biggest challenge now. And uh, it is related to uh, uh, two kind of paradoxes. The first paradox is that one of the causes of the revolution, as is well understood now, but it's not the only one, but it's a major one, is that there was a huge gap between the expectations of young people who are getting educated, not getting jobs, and not getting better uh, you know, uh, opportunities. And the reality of the economy, which was growing at, at a relatively slow rate, to deliver on this expectation. So this gap was, was big, and that's contributed to this uh, uh, uprising and revolution. Now, the paradox is that during this transition period now, this gap is increasing. Instead of getting you know, smaller, it's getting bigger because the expectations go up. People have made the revolution, the young people especially, and then they want to see some concrete uh, things happening to them. But the economy is going down. The economy is going down for a number of reasons that we can discuss if you want. But the fact is that this period is a period of increasing gap and therefore of increasing tensions. The second uh, paradox is that at the same time that a revolution is supposed to lead to better prospects and better opportunities in the medium term, in the short term uh, the uncertainty is such that private investment businesses are not ready to invest now. They are going to wait for the future. So we kind of bind that we need to bridge these two paradoxes. And uh, I would have thought that's where the external support can come in. The way to resolve that tension, if you like, partly at least, is for external support to come and help bridge that gap. And unfortunately, this help has not been forthcoming. We have not seen uh, much significant support except for the traditional one. We are told, go to the World Bank, go to the IMF, go to this and that. That's fine, we do go to the IMF, we go to the World Bank and so on. But is that only the only solution? And our, my message is no, it's not the only solution. Uh, these democracies, in order to succeed, they need to bridge these gaps that I talked about. And they need it now, not, not next year, not after the next election, not after the election after that, not after next year, not in two years. It's now that is needed. Otherwise, it puts in jeopardy the whole process itself. Let me, let me take this on two levels. The external support that you are hoping to get Clearly, it's not only from Europe, but also from the Arab region, or it should be, because others would say, why should only the Europeans or non-Arabs come in with it? Are you getting any such support from Arab countries? And secondly, and that's a separate question, but because I want to go back to the issue of Europe, the problem of migration and immigration. Do you have a strategy or any proposal to the Europeans so that they could deal with the issue of immigration, so that they can just find a solution rather than lock the doors and start to become very defensive. Is that a question to me yes, or to, to, you. The, to Europe? Well, pose it to Europe if you will. <laughs> and then I'll get answer. Okay. I can answer. You see, the, the assistance is very important. Uh, when we were in our position 20 years ago, the first what we need is security. And it was created by, by really moving towards NATO, and the NATO is a successful alliance, and you see that this question is, is out of agenda today. It's still in a different shape. The uh, second is institutional building. You need really governments who help you to build definite institutions. But this is not also uh, the main, main part, because the recipients must really define what assistance they are ready for. 
because if you just offer the assistance, it's a waste of time. And the third is the civic society uh, and the NGOs and international organizations played a very great role. Excellent. A very great role. And if you look at the, the, the we are in a great excitement that uh, Facebook and Twitter played a great role in the Arab Spring, that Facebook and Twitter is not going to govern the states. Mm -hmm but they can be a useful tool in creating civil society. Very good. To you then, back to you. Both the questions and a comment and reaction to the president's observations. I think, I think what the president says is right. I mean, clearly the, uh, the receptions in the country Tunisia has, or Egypt or whatever, has to define their, use, their needs and uh, what they need and so on. That's clear. Uh, and uh, implementation has to bring in all um, components of society. It has to be the private sector, the NGOs, the government has to build the I mean, all of this is absolutely right. I mean, and uh, Tunisia is trying to do that uh, in, uh, under very different circumstances. Uh, but this, uh, this does not uh, mean that, uh, because this is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm hearing from Europe, for instance. We're, we're hearing that, okay, uh, money is not the problem, you need to build the institutions, you need to do this and you need to do that, we need to coordinate, we need to have the international institutions. Uh, it's, I mean, we, we need to make sure that the money is going to the right places, that it's not lost. We agree, 100 percent, 1,000 percent. But still, for this to work, you need, you need resources. And resources, we are not talking only about government resources, we are talking about private investors. We want private investors to come in and to show that they are betting on the success of this revolution. We want the civil society to come in, to work with the civil society and so on. So it's a broad-based support that is needed. We are seeing some of it, but it's very, very weak, very little compared to the challenge that we have. Especially that we, have, we are dealing with all this. I mean, our friend will talk about Libya and so on. Uh, Libya, it has uh, its own implications for us, and we are bearing the whole burden of, of the side effects of the Libyan, uh, the Libyan, uh, you know, uh, revolution uh, on Tunisia, and uh, there is no support for it. We are not, we are not seeing any support, and it's very, very costly to us. So, in it's contrary to what you know, what the president was saying in the case of Latvia, there was support of Europe. There is anchoring and so on. In our case. What is happening in Libya is really going the other way. It's making life more difficult for us. Khalid Junahia, you come from Bahrain. Uh, uh, the business, you're a businessman. Business traditionally in the Arab world had really been in bed with uh, regimes in a very big extent. And suddenly they're scrambling. They don't know where to go. What about the business role in terms of these transitions? What, is, what are the... the uh, basically the frameworks of responsibilities that you need to be a part, as, as business people, part of this evolution rather than just sort of uh, ducking and waiting till the storm passes. Thank you. First of all, let me just apologize on behalf of the Iberian Airlines because they didn't bring my luggage and um, I couldn't get anything off the shelf. As you can see, my buddy doesn't get anything off the shelf. Is this so a promotion? My apologies <laughs> for not wearing a suit and a tie, especially in the presence of Raghada. Uh, coming to your question, and just I think before I hit into that, uh, the way you describe the business community is just like describing Obama and Cameron and the others because they don't know what the hell they're doing because they are in bed with the regimes, they've been sitting with the regimes and they don't know what to do and they were basically flying from one side to the other. And I don't like that uh, sort of connotation because it makes me feel very, very bad. But I think it's important just to, before we go into that, let's get some perspective from what Mustafa said and what the President said because I was just listening very carefully to the two. I think the issue of everybody's looking at what's going on now. Some people say it's fake, what's going on. Some people say, some people will feel every night when they sleep, this is a fake thing happening in this part of the world. Some people, without mentioning Niall Ferguson, saying, these people don't deserve democracy. They don't know what democracy is all about. It's an Islamist issue. So we have that aspect happening too, because he got 2008 correct, so he thinks he's getting this one is correct. Um, that's totally irrelevant because what we're missing, and I think it's a very, very important point that we're missing here, is that we have people, we have 350 million people going to 400 million people, southern of 500 million people in Europe, since we're sitting in Europe here. 400 million people soon. We have these 400 million people. They have three things that they just basically say, we don't want this anymore. Forget democracy, forget everything else. These are three words uh -huh. with three no's in front of them. 
we don't want. No suppression, no repression, no oppression. Does anyone in the world altogether, from Obama to a business person like myself, disagree on that, that individuals in this world should not have suppression, oppression, and repression? Right, forget so, democracy, yeah. forget every other aspect that people are talking about. We are not ready for it. We need support, we need help. All that is sideline. Yeah. I think it's very important that we agree on those three, uh, that the people, they don't want this. Now I'm coming to you. No, but, but come to the point, because otherwise uh, no, no, I'm coming to, to the, cut you off this, again. This is important. I think the business community, you're right. I mean, we were, we were in Davos. You, we had a similar session about Tunis and what was going on through Arab Spring because Tunis was happening, it had already happened, and Egypt was in the making. In Davos this year, the business community from the Arab world, they were all shying away even to talk about what was going on in Egypt because everybody was worried about sidestepping or saying something which would upset somebody in Egypt, upset Jamal Mubarak or upset somebody like that. You're right, the business community has been in bed with the regimes and that's why the business community we don't have truly I mean I have to accept this and look at the mirror and accept it as an Arab that we majority of us in the Arab world we made our business by basically being close to the governments innovation so what's now no now no no now now time has come that we sit back and say okay we have to what Mustafa said we have to invest and your point about where the money should come from I think the money from the Arab world should be basically spent in the Arab world before it goes out. We have over a trillion dollar of cash of the Gulf sitting in the United States. Why the hell are we keeping buying bonds of the United States rather than spending it in Egypt, spending it in East Saudi Arabia, spending it in the Gulf first, going to Saudi, going we, to Egypt, going to Yemen. Yeah. Look what's happening. So we need to spend the money before we go and ask for assistance from Europe and elsewhere. Okay, European Bank for Reconstruction, everybody else, let's spend it in our own part of the world before we ask the others. Now, one reason the money is out, this is the point, one money, the reason is that our, uh, the money is out, because lack of confidence from our people who are running the countries. Right. They prefer to put the money out because for a rainy day, like now, it is like the skies are really gray and it's going to be a rainy day, so it's better to have the money out. So when we are kicked out, we have the money out rather than being in. So I think it's very important that the business community we have to spend the money, and I've had actually just to come. I've been five times in Egypt. I, get, I need to interrupt you. I can't give you more time of a little opening statement than others. I need to interrupt you at this point, Mr. Aran. I love it when you interrupt. Yes, I know. <laughs> You're used to it. Um, uh, the Arab Spring has not impacted only the Arab neighborhood. Turkey has been impacted in the sense that some would argue that the Erdogan government is reinventing itself as a result of the Arab Spring. Do you agree? Uh, of course I do. Turkey is sitting in a very unique position. But before I come to that, uh, my business is news gathering. It's a news agency and we've been operating in the Middle East uh, and North Africa since 96. Of all those years, everything we heard in the region whenever we went to do business is, no, you can't do that. Now it's changed. There's a hope, there's a different attitude that yes, we can do this. Not the Obama campaign thing, but it's much broader than that. But it's not enough. Uh, all these tools that are available now, the Facebooks and Twitters, they've been helping to that tipping point that happened in Tahrir Square and elsewhere. But today there is a report that says that Egypt's tourism income will be down 35% this year. And it's going to continue to go down. What happened was enough to change one thing, but it's not enough to sustain anything. So the money that has to be spent, the rule of law that has to be established, the internal assistance that has to come between the Arab countries, which is not happening at this moment, all are necessary to see that this change is not going to be affecting others like Turkey, which is going through the, this uh, flow of uh, immigration at the time from Syria and losing businesses in Libya and losing tourism between Egypt, all of these, and will spread to Europe. But to prevent it all is to really help those young people that made this happen to become part of the system so they can rebuild the country. Otherwise, we will face one thing, which is a very messy, non-working democracy versus a pretty well decent working autocracy. And to choose between them is going to be a big failure. You have elections coming up, I think, this Sunday in Turkey. And it is being said that uh, the doctrine for the, you know, the ruling party has been uh, challenged because the relations of the past were with uh, uh, the regimes that uh, the Arab world is calling for their ousting from Libyan, uh, Libya's Muammar Gaddafi to uh, Syria's Bashar al-Assad, etc., etc. So do you think that this election is going to reflect 
a new doctrine, an adjustment of the doctrine, or do you think that uh, it is it is uh, it, 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 that it is immune, that Turkey is immune and is going to export its example, as the Turks likes to like to say that the Turkey is a good example to be exported to the Arab Spring. Well, uh, this election is going to reaffirm that whatever Turkey has been doing was the correct thing. This will be the third term for the same government, and they will be the single ruling party again in the parliament. And Turkey is a good model, but that model is not something that you can just export and turn it into something overnight and apply anywhere else. Even with the Arab Spring, all, everything happening in these countries are unique to themselves. Nothing happening in Egypt is not the same with the Libya or Tunisia or whatever the next country is. But Turkey proved something that a democracy can work, including all kind of uh, people from different backgrounds. It could be religious, it could be whatever the reasons and uh, backgrounds they have. Turkey is working closely with all these uh, changes happening in the region. Turkey has a plan for Libya. Turkey is working with Egypt. After the elections, I think Turkish foreign minister will be on the road again to uh, work closer with them. And he is, Turkey obviously established close ties with Syria. Turkey has teams in Syria talking to Bashar Assad almost every week now. Uh -huh. I know of the fact that this is happening because we just had Turkish foreign minister in our newspaper like a couple of weeks ago to talk about this. Turkey is helping them to understand what's working in Turkey and how much you can apply to that. Maybe not all, but some, so that the system can continue to go work. Maybe later in the discussion you will tell us if you think that there will be an overthrow, eventual overthrow of secularism in Turkey or not, but we'll get back. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. That's a great answer, quick answer. Uh, Tarek Yusuf, you come from Libya. Uh, Libya has received international support. Uh, the, Lib the, the Libyan revolution has received international support, also regional. GCC countries started it, the Arab League supported it, it went to the Security Council, NATO is, uh, uh, is, is launching operations. Uh, you've, Libya has been luckier than the, than the other uh, countries in the Arab region that have been overgoing uh, or undergoing the change in the Arab Spring. Is this satisfactory? Is this enough or you want more? You can never say it's enough, Ragheda. Uh, but what you can say is that I think Libya was in, indeed fortunate. And as a Libyan, I am extremely appreciative of what our neighbors have done, and especially of the leadership shown by Europe. Uh, I think this was a function of many things. There was a sense of moral responsibility to doing something in Libya, especially after a number of European governments spent the last decade actively rehabilitating Gaddafi and openly ignoring his brutality and open violations of human rights. So th there was an historical legacy there. Libya is also in the neighborhood of Europe. Libya matters. It's got financial resources. Immigration flows come through it. There are immense uh, oil interests at stake. But perhaps more importantly, Libya benefited from the fact that, in fact, uh, the Europeans felt a bit guilty and their slow response to Egypt and Tunisia. Their reluctance, their hesitation, uh, I think played a role, especially when combined with the open brutality of Gaddafi and the immense dislike that people in the world had for him. So we did benefit at the right time, at the right moment, from what seemed to be a clear and present danger in an area where the Europeans can, in fact, play a role, especially with the Americans play, uh, being in the back seat. So, a, mix of, a mixture of circumstances, not a, a single one of them matters more, but I would say in many ways Libya has done more to reaffirm for the world the relevance of Europe and the notion that Europe can play a role in open international arena, including in the United States, than perhaps uh, Syria or Tunisia or Egypt had done so, and in many ways we collectively benefit from this. If uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi hangs on as he's saying that he's not leaving, um, do you think, uh, do you fear this will lead to the partition of Libya? I don't think there will be a partition of Libya. Uh, I don't think the Libyans want it or will put up with it, nor will the Europeans or the outside international systems at large want to see a partitioned Libya. Uh, I think the discussions or the debates over a partitioned Libya took place sometime in the late 1940s, early 50s, 
That was over half a century ago. Uh, I think there is an agreement on the end game. There is an agreement on the end goal. Uh, but Libya faces a difficult challenge in the transition after Gaddafi leaves. Libya is not Egypt or Tunisia. There are no political institutions, no political parties, no civic society. There will be a lot of building from scratch. And I look to the Europeans for help here. I look to the countries of Europe that emerged after 1989 and rebuilt their political and economic systems almost from scratch once communism collapsed mm -hmm. for lessons and for inspiration on what Libya can, in fact, do. Uh, Mustafa Nabli, I think today there is going to be a very important meeting in Tunis basically looking at the potential roadmap for Tunisia. Uh, what are your concerns? What do you want to be sure to be secured for the future of Tunisia? What, what, what do you see happening actually? Is it the rehashing of old guard or is it actually the coming in of the new guard? What, what's happening uh, now actually is, is a democratic transition which needs to have to reduce the uncertainty as we go forward. People want to see how things are going to move forward over the next three months, six months, year. So people want to see in terms of political roadmap what are the next steps. Who is going to be uh, in charge in six months? Who is going to be in charge in a year? Uh, so that people can make sense of what is happening. People want to see what's happening to the economic policies, what's happening to the economy and so on. And the meeting today is one of those meetings which are critical because it is going to help clarify the roadmap over the next year or so in terms of the political transition. There has been a debate taking place over the date of the next elections for the Constitutional Assembly. Uh, the date that was fixed was for July 24th, and for technical reasons, the newly established independent uh, electoral commission has said that it cannot deliver fair, transparent elections in that time frame. So they asked to postpone it. Some people do not agree. So there has been a debate on when should the elections take place. So the meeting today is between the different parties, political parties, government, electoral commission, everybody sitting together and trying to work it out to, to agree on the next steps. So when are the elections going to be? What are the next government is going to be? Uh, what, what the Constitutional Assembly is going to deliver its work in terms of Constitution? So the idea is to have this meeting to arrive at a consensus which clarifies the roadmap for the next six months to a year in terms of political... Uh, President Zatla, do you have a specific advice for Tunisia as it is today considering the roadmap for the future? There are several roadmaps available. As I said, the experience of, of Eastern Europe, the experience definitely of Baltic states, we started from the communists. We didn't have any parties. We didn't have uh, any NGOs. We started with the NGOs and the parties followed. You have the Western Balkan experience, which is still on the road towards the you know, European Union, you know, and you see uh, the, on the example of Western Balkans how much damage the war or military conflict, you know, uh, does to, to the development, you know, they are at least 10 years behind. And I think uh, I like the idea of Turkey being a leader because uh, because of, there is no democracy of Islamic democracy, European democracy, American democracy, or African democracy. It's just democracy. People adapt to the, to the basic rules and values of democracy. But uh, a definite example, like Turkish Islamic democracy, now I'm a little controversial, but yeah. you see, it's easier for under, to understand for the region because the regional approach is very important. We had the same. We all in the Baltics had the same uh, goal to go, and so we are cooperating. At the same time, we were helping each other. At the same time, we, we really uh, pushed each other forwards. But uh, one more uh, lesson we have learned. If you look at the three countries, Belarus, Latvia, and Estonia, 20 years ago, they were on the same starting point, and how different are the results? Even being uh, in, in NATO and U European Union, both Estonia and Latvia, has still different results. And therefore, it's very important to learn from these lessons, to see why it happened, why Latvia is still fighting corruption today and Estonia isn't, and why Estonia is a highly developed country 
It's a definite correlation between the welfare of the country and the transparency and the freedom and as well as, you know, economic environment. Khadi uh, the President mentioned the Turkish model to be exported to the Arab world. Do you agree or would you rather have the Iranian model? I want to have a model which is the model of the people in the country itself. See, the people, I, I believe in one man, one vote for the constitutional setup in all the Arab countries. Once that's set up, that will legitimize the governments, the rulers around the Arab world today. So I think one man, one vote on the constitutional perspective. Now, if it's Islamist, everybody's worried about Islamist and Islamism in Egypt, so be it. I mean, they've been put aside for such a long time. They are the only prepared people who are going to come to the elections in September, if it goes on in September. They will get 30 to 40 percent of the, of the seats, that's for sure. And if Mr... They'll be getting what? 30 to 40 percent of the seats. They will get that. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhoods. I'm talking about Egypt now. Well, I mean, the, Egyptian, the Egyptians differ with you. They think they'll get 20 percent at most. Well, I, I don't know where your figures well, come I, I from. Think, I think they'll be smart to keep it at 20 percent. But I think if they want to get 30 to 40 percent, they will get 30 to 40 percent. But they'll be smarter to keep 20 percent in order actually not to do what Arbakan did in Turkey, since we're going to want to learn from Turkey a long time ago, and what Erdogan did afterwards, which was the right way of coming in through later on. So I think the Muslim Brotherhoods will come through. They'll be the biggest power in Egypt. And the reason I'm talking about Egypt, because Egypt is the pivotal country in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. What happens in Egypt is going to affect all of us in the Arab world. Will it affect really the Gulf states, the GCC countries, uh, or are the GCC countries immune of the Arab Spring, given that they are monarchies, they're not constitutional monarchies, they are you know, absolute monarchies. You come from that region, you come from Bahrain. Tell me about the, exp the well, Bahrain almost no. went through the Arab Spring and then didn't. And uh, uh, tell me if you think these Gulf states are immune well, of the Arab Spring. No one is immune from the person, as I said at the beginning. No one wants repression, no one wants suppression, no one wants oppression. Those three words, whether they like it or not, all across the Arab world, all the rulers, the 22 countries in the Arab world, they have to accept that's going to be a reality from now on. And even from Europe and the United States, they have to accept that this is not a fakeness on this thing. People, the people power in the Arab world is now reality, is not a myth anymore. So we are there, we're saying, hey, we are not good enough for democracy, we're going to be Islamists, fine, forget all that. We are not interested in that. What we want basically is we don't want autocracy. That's what we don't want. So everybody in the Arab world, regardless where it is, they are not immune from this. And one thing, by the way, talking about rulerships, in the Arab world altogether. I mean, everybody talks about what happened in Tunis and what happened in Egypt and later on elsewhere. There has been leaderless revolutions or revolt. And I suppose, surprisingly, that's not... It's an awakening, if you will. No, no, that's not very surprising because we don't have leadership per se. For the past 30 to 60 years in different Arab countries, we've not had leadership. We've had rulerships across the board. So you don't expect these revolutions to be lead, led by anybody. Some people will take advantage of it. Uh -huh. okay? Like what happened in Bahrain was taken advantage of by Iran, for argument's sake. So different places, there is people take advantage, but they are leaderless today. Let me uh, try to get a couple of uh, questions from the floor, then come back and forth. Uh, and could somebody help me with raising their hands very Hi, so that uh, you will be given the microphone first, please, and introduce yourself kindly. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed Jafar from Kuwait. I think Dubai will be immune uh, for, for a simple reason. I think they have the processes and they've developed the human capital uh, that will allow them to weather, to weather the, the storms or not to be included in that storm. Um, if, if you look at the... Um, civic education in Dubai and what, how citizens behave, um, you find that there's a difference to uh, how citizens behave in other nations, if you take Yemen, for example. So I think there could be exceptions, and it's not because of uh, oil, but because of tolerance, vision, um, but maybe that would be the only exception. All right. I, I want to take three or four observations and questions from the floor, then come back to the panel. Can I see some hands up? Yes, please, kindly. Lindsay Howard, International Bank of Azerbaijan. We've spoken a lot about the Middle East. Could we turn back to Central Asia? It's a very different region. It's not the Middle East. It's the former Soviet space. It's not Asia. It's its, its own region. Could some of the speakers address what they see as the impact 
the differences and similarities of the conditions in these countries. Do you have a person in mind that you'd like to answer this question? <clears throat> he knows. Uh oh. Is this, is this planted? <laughs> Can we please have uh, the mic here? Thank you, Verena Knaus um, from Austria, but having been living in Turkey and the Balkans for the last 11 years, I just want to maybe put a, a note of caution. Having worked in the Balkans, and as President Sattler described, you know, it's a very different region which had a very clear goal. So the whole countries emerged from war, from conflict. There was a lot of money. You know, to give the example of Kosovo, about more than 2 billion euros were spent on assistance, and none of the Arab countries would get similar amounts. And still, we are now talking 10, 15 years since the conflict, and there are lots of issues from institution building, rule of law, um, citizen-state relations. Even there is this objective of European Union membership. And the difference between Latvia and Belarus is exactly that Belarus did not have that objective, and so the revolution went astray, left and right. My question is, what kind of objective can the European Union offer, or what kind of objective could the Arab countries themselves create to give the revolution a goal. Otherwise, it will sort of drift left and right, and maybe leadership will emerge, but maybe not. Thank you. I th take two more uh, questions and observations. First row here, please. Jochen Wermut from Wermut Asset Management. We German investing in Russia for years <coughs> and former Soviet Union. Uh, what would the panel think about the idea of providing incentives uh, in the Middle East, of course, it could be an incentive for European Union memberships, uh, not just for Turkey, but for Israel, Lebanon, Tunis, yes? How about Russia? If Russia adopted the acquis communautaire and decided to be really democracy as it announces, Russia could be a member, and the Middle Eastern, Central Asian countries also have the incentives. Could the European Union go beyond its crisis and think bigger again? Thank you. One more. Yes, over there. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Alex from SoundCloud. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see technology having played into the uh, most recent events, and if you think there's anything, if you think technology has played played a large part, if there's anything we can do to um, to speed up the advancement of technology to let more people be part of things like this. Uh, with your permission, Mr. President, I'm going to start with uh, Tariq because I want the uh, issue of technology and the use of technology and the youth, uh, not only use the youth's uh, impact into this Arab Spring to be addressed. If I may come back to you, because most of the questions are to you actually, but I'll start with Tariq if you, and, and then I'll go to Ahmed and then to you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Raghida. Uh, I think I've spent the last five years thinking, writing, and being a part of a number of research and programs looking at youth in the Arab world. We covered as many areas as we thought were relevant and important, except one, the role of technology. In particular, the role of social media, not only as a, a, a social tool or as a news uh, transference tool, we completely underestimated the power of the social media to emerge in the space and, in fact, make news. Uh, in the case of Libya, I can say this with every ounce of confidence I, I have in me. The revolution in Libya was set, started, sustained, primarily initially by activists using the social media. Nothing more, nothing less. Hence, right now, I think we're playing catch-up. We're trying to understand how social media works. And when we look out, it's not clear that anybody else understands social media or the role of technology in social mobilization and political life very well. This is one area where I would say it's not about economic cooperation or financial help, but it's about technological and social science study of very important facets of life that we all should be paying attention to. Ahmed, you're a media person, but you are a news agency. Is your era over? Because the new ones are coming in. And then please address some of the points that were made about Turkey. Sure. I would repeat the same, but there's one step, one step before what happened was for the last 10 to 15 years, the satellite broadcasting over uh, the Arab region and North Africa expanded dramatically. It's probably more than a thousand satellite TV stations all over in the region. This has not just uh, happened like the social media like a couple of years ago. This has a 15-year history. We were part of that history. We have been broadcasting news in the region for the last 15 to 16 years. 
But it, it was one way. People could set up satellite dishes, even if it was prohibited in many parts of the region, could just hide them and watch what the rest of the world is talking about and doing and how they are living. But it was only one way. There was no way to react to that or let the, any, let the others know about it. Once the text messages came to cell phones, it started to change the relations between people who want to talk about the same issues. And then, obviously, Twitter came, Facebook came, computer uh, connections came. People were ready. It's just that social media didn't bring everything all together at once. People were ready for the change. They knew a lot about what's happening in their countries or elsewhere, but they could just not communicate that. It enabled that communication, and it became like a wildfire. But again, it was always, it helped and encouraged for that tipping point. But I'm repeating myself again, this mm -hmm. social media, all this technology, it wasn't the only reason. Yeah, would you mind addressing some of the points made by some of the questioners on Turkey? Can you repeat that? Some of the questions came, they were related to Turkey. Do you want to address that? Well, uh, the Turkey issue is, I'm not comfortable with the Turkey describing Turkey as an Islamic democracy. It's a secular democracy, just that the for, government... For the moment, right? Until, and it will be. Because until the why, elections, if why Mr. Anyone, Erdogan gets what, 367 seats, uh, I guess it's automatically, it take, without they, referendum they, even. They could take 400 seats. Doesn't matter. Why would anyone upset a system that is growing 10% every quarter? Why would one upset that? It's because, all economy. Well, that's interesting because an argument is that they actually is after upsetting that system. I mean, actually, no. Turkey tells, Turkey tells uh, that it could be a very nice secular democracy run by a very pious person. Interesting. It works. Right. It's, it's, I'm glad because <laughs> I'm going to work. Istanbul tomorrow. I will take this question to the street and find out. Mr. President, I'll come back to both of you later, but please go ahead. Many questions. So the the questions about the, the, the goals, targets, and objectives. No they not should but must be created by the nation itself otherwise it's not working because it's a question of, about values and what are the values the values are are supported by the every individual as an individual and then by the nation as a nation so they stand by and stand for these values and then the objectives the targets uh, and goals are created there's no other way. All the other ways lead to a failure. Now, there was a corresponding question about the Central Asia, and I will talk a little bit about the Eastern Partnership, because we have been very active as, as a country in the Eastern Partnership. What does it mean? Try to assist these countries on, their, on the way to into improving democracy and a civil, civic society. So, what are the lessons learned? We have come with a, with a, with a full toolbox and offer them, it's not working because they don't know how to use the tools. That's right. But what I would like to emphasize is all the time a window of opportunity with some of the nations. We had great expectations with Ukraine, then we were a little bit disappointed. Now we are looking very carefully what's going on there. We were much more, uh, less expectations in Moldova. Today, Moldova is might be the, the best example, like Tunisia, you know, were to us to whom to assist. So we have to be very flexible in offering the assistance. We shouldn't be very uh, strict on that, you know, because the situation changes by election to election, by some different other events, like in Georgia, whatever, including, uh, including uh, Azerbaijan. Because I'm in a great contact with most of the leaders of this region, and uh, the, the advantage I see they really understand me much uh, easily because for some time we have lived in the same communist Soviet space and we had some, some kind of a common experience too. So we are trusted much more, but nevertheless, you know, uh, they have to learn from the other spring, not to get some Central Asian autumn. That's right. Look, I, will get, I really want to get uh, all of you to, to address this the potential coming of autumn and what needs to be done so that it doesn't turn into a terrible winter in the Arab world. But before that, I want to quickly go to, to both of you on two different questions. I know there was one question addressed to you, or as I said, planted for you. Would you answer that question uh, quickly, uh, Khalid, so that I can I have only seven minutes? Yes, that, as we were joking about it with my okay. friend over there. Yeah, that was about the, well, Central Asia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know which one. Yeah, I know. I think, uh, coming back, what's happening in Egypt today and what's happened in Egypt, what's going to happen in Egypt, 
is going to affect everybody. It's not just going to affect Central Asia, it's going to affect even China. It's affecting even the United States in certain places. Like, as, well, I don't know what Arkansas sounds like, like walking like an Egyptian. So I think it is affecting everywhere and it will affect everywhere. Central Asia has to learn and learn very, very fast. I mean, corruption, institutional corruption as we have it in Central Asia has to go. Before we talk about anything, that has to go away. And that is big, big, big time in Central Asia. As a matter of fact, it's much bigger than the Arab world if I can say that. Now, if European Union and the Arab world, the 500 million people in the European Union, like it or dislike it, they have 400 million people just in south of themselves. There are issues that they have to look at. There is social issues, there is economic issues, and there is political issues. This is an aging society where we're talking about the 500 million. 400 million is a young, very young society. The gentleman on my left, far left, knows this very, very well. Majority of us in that part of it, we are below the age of 30. Majority, 70% yep. of us are below the age of 30. And now that, if we don't, the 500 million here, they do not think of those 400 million dealing, and I'm mentioning 400 million people. I'm not talking about 22 regimes. I'm talking about 400 million people. If we do not, the 500 here, take that into consideration. Those people have right. the same rights as they do here in terms of accepting their governments in, a, in certain uh, going and talking in terms of having the room for proper education, critical thinking, right. then we're going to have a major problem coming in the future. Uh, Mustafa Nabli, I don't know whether you said enough about this, but the immigration strategy that you might have in mind to suggest to the Europeans in order to deal with this problem, particularly from North Africa, I think you have in mind some limited numbers. Have you discussed it with the Europeans? Have they reacted? What sort of reaction? Can you just shed some light on this very important issue of how to deal with the matter of immigration? And I know you are, Theresa is also a victim of the other immigration coming from Libya. It's a different uh, set of problems that you're having. Um, let me correct the last sentence. Uh, we don't think that we are victim to the Libyan migration, it's, uh, we welcome the migration because it's for a good cause. Can you please, can, yeah. We, we welcome the migration from Libya because it's for a good cause. We don't, uh, it, we, we don't consider ourselves victim. What we are saying, it's costly and then we would like to see burden sharing for this cost. That's, what, that's the point we are making. Uh, I think for us the migration issue should not be at the center of the uh, discussion with Europe. And we think that we find that the Europeans are obsessed by migration and everything is seen from the lens of migration and every help and every support, everything they do is just migration. I mean, because 20,000 people crossed the border of Tunisia and went to Lampedusa in early January uh, because security was down, their border controls were, were down and so on, and every, you know, hell broke loose in, in Europe. And uh, we have 70,000 Libyans or 80,000 Libyans, they come to Tunisia and they are there and then we're, they are welcome, we are dealing with, the, with that. And uh, it, it's, not, it's, it's a problem, but it's not something that you, you know, kind of construct a whole neighborhood policy around. And I think that has been clearly, uh, you know, it's not going to help Europe develop a strategy along the way. That, now, what we want, even if you want to talk migration, what I say, I have always said to my friends, the European uh, friends, is the policies that you are following are counterproductive. You are getting the worst of both worlds. By saying no migration, you are not achieving no migration. You are having migration, but you are having not the migration that is best for you, you are having the migration that is worst for you because you are having the illegal migration, you have the migrants who are ready to, who are ready to risk their lives because they have no, nothing to lose and this is not necessarily what Europe needs in terms of migration. On the other hand, migration, Europe needs migration. Everybody knows that. Europeans know that. The demographics, you know, say it. And we have looked at this, you know, right and left and all the numbers and it's clear there is a win-win situation. There is a migration that is good for Europe and good for the southern Mediterranean. And we should think about how to make this migration take place instead of having the migration that is taking place today, which is not good for the southern countries, it's not good for Europe, it's not good for anybody. Um, in a very brief one sentence, because I have to conclude, and it has to be one sentence, I have five minutes only. Uh, may, maybe, maybe Tunisia is out of the harm's way right now at least because there is 
institutions and education enough to take it forward. We're not sure Egypt is out of harm's way because the transition is very fragile and it's an economic bomb if it doesn't work. Uh, in, in Libya, we have a situation that looks that it will be concluded uh, uh, if NATO sort of you know, highlights its, uh, its activities in, in Libya. But if uh, Muammar Gaddafi insists on staying, we're not so sure if that's not going to be an example for others to, set, to think they could hang in there. And uh, in Yemen, we're not so sure if uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the president of Yemen, is going to accept the deal offered to him by GCC, whether he stays in uh, Saudi Arabia where he's getting medication or goes back. And if he goes back, what trouble we have. In Syria, we don't even know uh, what's, what, what uh, model is President Bashar al-Assad looking at. Is he looking at the model of Bahrain or is he looking at any of the models that I mentioned? Qadhafi, uh, Abdullah Saleh, Mubarak, Zain al-Abideen. So uh, certainly we have very brave people in Libya. As you mentioned, Tariq, uh, people who have been broken and they've risen really from, from, from a very systematic breaking method. The same in Syria. Is this Arab Spring going to last? Is it going to become uh, an autumn and then a winter where you bury it? One sentence about what you think, what do you hope? And I'll start with you, Tariq, and I'll conclude with the president. That's hard, Raghida. One sentence. Uh, yes, please help me with that. So the I'm sentence not... is, I think we're seeing the beginning of a new Arab political order within the region. Uh, I have uh, the utmost confidence in that one statement. And I think the sooner countries come to terms with it, both within the region and outside, the faster it will be to aid the process and to make it as peaceful, stabilizing, and as in the interest of everyone as possible. A majority of Arabs today already live in countries that are going through some sort of a transition. By the end of the year, it will be a, maybe a dominant majority. The new Arab world order, or the Arab order, is going to be one that is driven by the countries uh, placed in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere. They will be the center of gravity. They will be the inspiration for ideas. Uh, it, is no longer the, it, it is no longer the Arab world as we knew it just a, a few months ago. Thank you, Tariq Youssef, Dean of Dubai School of Government from the UAE. Uh, I'll give the floor to Ahmed Oren. Sentence, please. Well, uh, so hard to say a few things in one I know. sentence, but we'll try. Um, <laughs> It is a very dramatic change, and it already happened. It will not go back. But uh, it taught something. It has two messages. One was the message that showed the extreme wildest, wild, uh, extreme wildness, that uh, extreme violent, violence is not the right message. So the rhetoric behi behind Al Qaeda and other forces in the region had a blowback. But it's one thing. The second message is the remaining dictators that they need to behave better. They need to learn from this. They need to adapt. They, not, they should stop humiliating their people. And some of those who are uh, richer than the others are now spending much more money and buying some time. But the change will continue. And the change will come to all of it. That's, this, this is not turning back. Thank you, Ahmed Oren, Chief Executive Officer of Elas Holding from Turkey. Yeah. Uh, to, be, to be short, uh, I would like to say that in uh, to uh, use an analogy, I think there has been climate change. The climate, the cha the climate has changed in, the, in this region. It's not the same climate that we have seen before, and it's changed forever. Now, within that climate change, there is going to be geography, there is going to be seasons, there is going to be all kinds of things. It's not going to be one season or another. It's going to be different things. There are different places. It's going to take time. It's going to move around and things. But the, the climate has changed, and it has changed for the better. Thank you, Mustafa Kamil Nabli, Governor of the Central Bank of Tunisia. Khaled? Yeah, I think uh, everything has been said, uh, I agree with, but I think just to add one important thing, since we're sitting in Europe and sitting in the West, I think the West to regain its morality when it comes to the Arab world, because as far as I'm concerned today, morally it's bankrupt with the way it's been dealing with the Arab world, with the people of the Arab world. I think the West has to now understand and accept to use the word catch-up, no longer more of a catch-up, red one or not red one. I think they have to have it, they have to be there, they have to understand things will not be back as they were before. It's not fake, this is a reality on ground and it's going to go forward. The people of the Arab world will be equal to the Europeans and everybody else in terms of what they want for themselves, for their children, for the future. 
Thank you, Khalid Abdullah Janahi, Honorary Chairman, Vision 3 from the UAE, as in, uh, of the base in the UAE. Mr. President. Three points. Uh, first, uh, it's the beginning of the process and no step backs. Second point, uh, we need uh, in the short term one positive example, success story, at least in a one step forward in the region. Uh, third point, uh, I will emphasize again the regional importance and the transition in Arab League must start. In the Arab League. In the Arab League. That's important, very important. Uh, Vlad, uh, Valdi Zatlers is president of Latvia. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Raghida Dergam. I'm with Al Haya, and I thank you for participating in this session. And until next time with the WEF, wherever we are, whether it is at the Dead Sea or in Davos. Thank you very much.